the month seminar for December. And um, today we're going to be discussing uh, textbooks and we have guests from Florida Virtual Campus to um, present some of their work to us. Um, shall I hand over to you, Robin? Maybe you could do um, a brief introduction for yourself and for E, because um, E can't speak on the uh, system today, but he's going to be available on chat. So over to okay. you. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm Robin Donaldson. I'm the Director of Member Research and Services. Um, we, FLVC, provide services to all 40 of our public higher education institutions in Florida. And um, so sometimes we administer different types of research studies throughout the state or with small subsets of the institutions. Um, e Shen is a um, researcher uh, who works part-time with me. He's also full-time at another institution. He uh, is fabulous with statistics and computers and his PhD is in instructional systems. Um, so I, I think that's, that's good enough for, for where we are. Um, so what I'm going to cover is, during this presentation is an overview for the textbook survey and then if there's any interest at the very end, I can give you a brief overview of how Florida is addressing the textbook costs. But the main uh, focus is just simply on the textbook survey findings. So let me give you a little bit of uh, information on Florida. There is, are about a million students in our 40 public higher education institutions. And um, um, about 2.8 million of the adult population actually have uncompleted college degrees. And you'll understand why that's important and why I bring that up now later on in the presentation. So, um, as you know, the, the cost of textbooks is a significant strain on our college students um, everywhere. I assume even in the UK, you, you have to pay for some of your, your textbooks. And it's traditionally viewed as a financial challenge for our students. And in, in some of our states, uh, the cost of textbooks for used in an associate degree, and that means the first two years of your college, can be one third the cost of their actual degree. So that's, that's a huge amount, and that's just on your, your textbook costs. So this is, it means for our students, what we found with the 22,000 students that participated in this survey, that uh, the findings are showing that, that cost of textbooks is not just a, a financial burden, but it's also impacting their completion and success. So this survey is a continuation of ones that we've done in 2010, 2012, and then this one is in 2016. The reason we administer this survey is to help provide a snapshot to the uh, state university system chancellors, the Florida college system chancellors, um, the, in the institutions, and the legislative staff, a snapshot of the situation with college textbook costs as well as instructional materials. So in this 2016 survey, we extended it from just textbooks to include instructional materials. And that was to address some additional legislative interest. So, excuse me, the font's really tiny on my screen, so I have to look down some. So, um, the amount, what we wanted to find out from this survey was to find out how much students are paying for their textbooks um, during the spring semester and then the frequency that they're buying textbooks that are not covered um, or not utilized in their courses. And then we wanted to know, all right, here, this is how much you're paying, but what is the effect of this 
on your you financially and as well as your academic success and then what actions are they taking to try and reduce their textbook costs and then how has this changed over time between the 2012 survey and the 2016 survey so all 40 of our institutions participated uh, we were able to get 22,000 students participating, and the way we're able to get these large numbers is we have the support of the state university system as well as the Florida college system. So what happens is the Board of Governors actually sends out a request to each university to their provost asking them to please participate in the study. They're not required, it's they are requesting it. Then um, the Florida College System sent out a request to their chief academic officers. And the survey instrument ha only has 11 questions, takes about 10 minutes. Uh, an additional question was added to, like I said, to address the legislative interest in uh, instructional material costs. So, the first finding that we we looked at was okay well how much are they saying that they are spending on their their college textbook costs and as you can see here 53 percent are saying they're spending over 300 in the spring 2016 term 17.9 spent over 400 and um uh 14.6 spent 14 i'm sorry 400 to 500 so it's, it's a substantial um, amount of money that they're paying for just their textbook. Now, how does this compare to our 2012 survey? Um, if you look at the two uh, ends of the spectrum, the cost category for the zero to 100 decreased from 9.8 to 8.2, but um, it's interesting to note that the category for 600 or more uh, increased from 8.5 to 8.9. Um, and as you can see here, there, there, it just depends. There was some increase here and here in the different categories. And then we looked at the same thing and broke it out into degree levels. And in the U.S., it, we have associate degrees, which are usually just two years, your, and those are um, taken at your colleges. Then we have bachelor degrees, which is your four-year degree, and then master's and doctorate degrees. And as you'll see here, it's the students who are seeking associate degrees and bachelor's degrees that are spending the most the, uh, for the 300 or more category versus the master's or the doctorate degree. So we also looked at unofficially the area of studies. So here, as you can see right here, the law, this shouldn't be as uh, too much of a surprise, law and medicine, um, the, law, there were 75% of them were spending uh, 301 or more. Um, and then we came down to the STEM um, and then the uh, health, health and medical um, education. And then the lowest um, ones in this category were the visual and performing arts. At the high end of the spectrum of the, the cost category here, um, it was showing that the there were more students having to pay the 300 and above. And of the students surveyed, we had 56.3 who were saying that they spent 300 or more um, for the college students, but only 50% of them for the university. So the college's students were being impacted more heavily than the university students. So we had undergraduate degrees, which is your your um, your associates and your bachelors. They were more in the 300 um, and above. And then, as you can see here, the college students versus the university. 
So again, we looked at the spending of course materials. This was new from the 2012 survey. And you'll see here over a three quarters are spending more than $200 or 200 or less. So on top of your textbooks, they have to buy their instructional materials. And then we had 16% um, were spending 200 to 400 and then 6% were spending 400 or more. We again broke that out into um, the college and university students here. And um, as you can see, 12% here, the college students were reporting spending 300 or one on instru instructional materials, but only 9.8 um, or three were, were reporting that for your university students. So again, the, the, the college students are impacted more heavily. Now, sometimes instructors will tell the students that a certain textbook is required, but then the students aren't assessed on any of the content in it. It's not used. We wanted to find out um, how, many, how many textbooks in their academic career um, they were reporting that they had to buy, but the textbook wasn't used. So um, in 2012, that number was 1.6. But in 2016, that number jumped to 2.6. That's a significant difference. So that was a very uh, troubling fact there. Then we have to find out, OK, how much of their textbooks are being covered by their financial aid? And we did a comparison with the financial aid from 2016 and 2012. And hold on and let me get to that page here. So here you can see that with the financial aid, 20.6 um, versus 27.9 in 2012 reported that the, their financial aid paid for all of their textbook costs. So, and then as you can see here, it's about the same for those students who are reporting that Text, the financial aid did not cover any of their textbooks. So pretty dramatic there. I'm going to skip this one, if you will. Um, then the impact on the textbook cost. So how is this impacting them academically? And here you can see right here, 66.5 are not buying their textbook. They reported that they, they had not bought their textbook. That's one of the ways that they had um, addresses. Now for this question, just so you understand, um, th this they could select multiple ways in which they were dealing with the high cost of textbooks. So um, not buying the textbook ranked the highest and then if you come over here to, they're taking fewer courses. So, so there's pieces of this where it deals with access and completion. They're taking fewer courses. Um, they're not registering for a particular course. They're dropping a course or they're withdrawing from a course. So by, that, by the not register for a particular course, that may mean that they may want a, a specific instructor, but that instructor is going to be using a highly uh, a, a, a textbook that's going to cost more money than they can afford. So they might select a different instructor or they just might simply if it's an elective, they choose a different elective. So it's impacting their access and completion. Then it's also impacting their success rate. So you can see here the students are also reporting that the high cost of textbooks had also caused them to earn a poor grade or to fail a, a course. Now, compared to 2012, the same negative impact on, on student learning and progress, um, as you can see right here, has increased since 2012. So what they're saying is they're earning a poor grade, failing a course, and not purchasing the textbook. 
it's increased since the 2012. For the degree levels, we also analyze the same, same question for degree level. Um, in college students, um, the trend is the same. They're more negatively impacted. So on here, you can see that for the, uh, these are your associates and your bachelors here. More students in the associate degree, that's your first two years. They're saying that they have to take fewer courses, not register for a specific course, or withdraw from a course. That means they may register for a course and then learn in the first week that the textbook is required and it's too expensive. So they may withdraw from the course. Um, they might try and complete it the, the first few weeks without that textbook and just not able to. So they withdraw from it. Um, then you can see here for the students in, in the bachelor programs, the more of them reported failing a course. 72% reported not purchasing the textbook. Earning, and then we have 42 reporting not earning a good grade and then dropping a course. Um, and then, as you can see, it's just these three, the associates or two, the associates and bachelors who are the most negatively impacted. So area of study. For this, we informally grouped some of the different categories that we had. Um, and you'll see that it's, it's pretty much evenly distributed. Then another area that we were interested in getting information on is what actions are the students taking to reduce their cost? And from here, we learned that 64% of the cost saving measures was it was the purchasing the textbook from somewhere other than the college uh, bookstore. Um, and then 50% reported buying the used copies. And then as you can see, they're, they're renting here. So they're renting, they're buying from somewhere other than the college bookstore, and they buy the used copies. Um, who would they rent from? In, um, in the U.S., they're able to rent books from the bookstore. So the college bookstore will buy the books back from the students if they're not heavily marked up. And then they will rent those books back to the students or the students can buy the used copies. In addition, uh, places like Amazon, you can actually buy the used copies and rent from Amazon. There's a whole, whole slew of areas, I mean companies, that will let you rent or buy used ones. I know a number of students who opted to actually rent from Amazon. The difficulty um, here in the US is that if you're using financial aid, you have to buy from the college bookstore. So that does make it that does make it harder on the students that way. So compared to 2012, this was uh, this was fairly dramatic here. You can see that the students um, buy used copies from the campus bookstore. This decreased. In 2012, 63% of buying used bookstore, books from the campus bookstore, that dropped down to 48.8 in 2016. Um, here we have um, the renting digital textbooks that was added to this version of the survey. It wasn't in the 2010 or 2012. And almost 30% reported, of course, renting the digital textbooks. Um, in the earlier survey, we also had the option of did you did the students prefer to buy the the lifetime access to a digital textbook? Um, we were thinking some students in uh, let's say the medical field that were getting digital textbook might want that for lifetime access. But as you can see, there was a very dramatic drop in the numbers reporting this. 
Um, so that's, here we go. Okay. Willingness to rent. We needed to find out were the students, how willing were they to, to rent their textbook? Because they may be willing to rent their textbooks, but they may not be actually renting because they're just not available. There's not, the books they need aren't available to be rented from either Amazon or from their college textbook um, business there. So um, as you can see, it jumped from 35% to 51%. Yes, they're interested in renting digital or print. Um, and as you can see down here, the no and maybe category dropped so that fewer students are saying no they're not interested in renting and fewer students are just on on the fence and saying maybe so textbook and instructional material cost um, Truly, they should not be a barrier to our students being able to get a degree. Um, and in the reason I bring this up is at the very beginning, I mentioned that 2.8 million adult students drop out and, and have um, not completed their college degree. And one study that was done reported that um, over 50% say that they're more like that um, those who don't complete college are more uh, um, are over 50% more likely to say that textbook costs were a major financial barrier. Um, students uh, using open educational resources uh, take heavier loads. That was found in one study compared to those using commercial textbooks. And this is important because if they're able to take a heavier load, then that could be shortening their time to completion which reduces their their overall financial burden simply because they're not having to stay in school as long. They're earning a, um, a salary, so that's that's important. Um, so let me go back to this here. Um, let me stop here and ask you: Do you have any questions about the data? or um, questions about how we conducted the survey? So I had a clarification question. Um, can you hear me at the moment? Yes. Hello? Yes, okay, good. Um, when you were giving us the figures uh, for um the costs was that per student or per student per class this is it's quite, per quite student. far back now but, um so student each student was so each of the the students who participated they were saying how much they as an individual spent overall for the semester so it may have included one course or multiple First. courses um that was <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the um, suggestions that we received this year was to actually ask the students how many courses they are enrolled in and how many books they had to buy to get a better understanding of, okay, you're spending, let's say, 300 to $400, but you're only buying one book, two books, three books, because some of these students will be full-time students and some will be part-time so we'll probably add uh, additional questions to get clarification on that okay thank you and thanks e um question from beck and natalie how widely used are oer and open textbooks in florida are there specific initiatives to promote use we have actually i i can um I can go into that with um, the next other slides, but I'll just answer it here. It's easier. We actually have two institutions. They're both colleges um, that have gotten Achieving the Dream grants. So they're working on OER programs. Um, and then those are the most organized um, 
and then it's just intermittent at each campus, each institution, how they're addressing OER and if they have OER courses. It's strictly um, faculty interest and willingness to do it. But I would say the two that have the Achieving the Dream are the most involved in either OER or what zero cost. It may be proprietary content, but it's zero cost to the student. Uh, Kate, do we have any other questions at this point? Um, I have one question. If no one else is going to ask one, I might ask you it. Um, and it was to do with this idea that the, the sort of negative impacts of not having access to a textbook have increased between 2012 and 2016. Um, what kind of what kind of explanations might we might we give for that? Is it, is it something that's changed, uh, or is there in, in terms of institutional changes, or is there some other reason, economic changes that might explain that difference? Are you are you asking me why do we why are we finding that more students are saying that they're failing the courses or not buying their books? I mean, if more students yeah, aren't buying their textbook, they're less likely to be successful um, in in earning a good grade and completing the course. Then, and the other thing is that uh, I'm not a financial aid expert, but with financial aid they may not be able to continue to receive their financial aid throughout the term if they withdraw from a class. So if that's the case and they're counting on that money, they might choose to go ahead, well, I need that money to be able to pay my rent or whatever, so I, I'm not going to withdraw from the class or drop it. I'm going to go ahead and continue, even though I know I'm going to earn a, a poor grade. So I, I think that's one of the, the issues to consider. Okay, thank you. So um, I'll go put us back into listening mode and please continue. It's not the one we want. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm still seeing question and answer mode. Yeah, let me move that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so uh, Florida is addressing the, the high cost of textbooks and instructional materials in different ways. I popped into question and answer mode, but I think I can, um, if everybody else can see the slides, it won't bother me, okay? Um, so in this, this area, what I'm gonna talk about is um, independent solutions, legislative action, um, how the SUS system um, is addressing this, our grants, and then a report that the library uh, system has created. So let me see here, hang on, there we go. Um, legislatively, Florida has been always been very concerned about the access and um, affordability of college for our, our students. So what was added this past year was it the piece for instructional materials. Our institutions are required now to disclose to the students not only uh, the textbook cost uh, so that they can know this before they enroll in a course, but also the cost of their instructional materials. Um, the institutions have to adopt policies and procedures and guidelines on how they're trying to minimize the cost of textbooks and instructional materials. And then they have to report the cost of their books and instructional materials to the um, SUS and the FCS system. Another way that we are addressing it, that, the cost of textbooks, is through uh, a program that's called Complete Florida. So, um, for our student, student body, 85% of them 
don't fit the traditional um, definition of a, a, a traditional student. Uh, a traditional student is a student who leaves high school and goes immediately into college or the university system. Um, adult learners may not be returning to college um, until they're in their 30s or 40s, or they've stepped, stopped out and need to return. So um, Complete Florida is a way in which our, our students can come back to the college, colleges and universities, uh, and these students have already earned some of the, the credit toward a degree. Um, and then there are 15 institutions that have uh, joined this partnership, and it's completely 100% online. Uh, this program is designed to address affordability, accessibility, and accelerated degrees. Um, in the partners, one of the goals is to encourage uh, the use of OERs and zero textbook uh, courses, zero cost textbooks, texts and materials. Um, the program also in, uh, is competency-based and prior learning assessment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, two of, the, uh, two of our colleges, their partners for this program, they have uh, the Achieving the Dream grants and they're going to have fully uh, online OER programs. Um, We'll also be generating a uh, case study with um, one of the Florida State College of Jacksonville. In addition, we have the state university system. They have a strategic plan that is uh, addressing a, a, a wide range of issues, uh, affordability, uh, access, and quality. And what we've done, we've we're working together with the colleges and universities. They, they have a uh, work groups for each of these areas, and we have representation from universities as well as colleges um, on these work groups to try and come up with some, some specific goals and tactics. So I'm just, I inserted just a few of those. There's a, a number of uh, strategies and tactics. And I included these because um, they were some of the ones that specifically impacted our organization. Um, they want us to develop a, a model for reducing the cost of textbooks and using OER within the state of Florida. Um, and also, we want to try and um, come up with a way where we can share support services. And um, one of those is the expansion of um, what's called the Orange Grove. That's our Florida uh, repository for OER materials. Um, work with our institutions on how we can improve that and provide training on OER and create commons and encourage and support our institutions and faculty in using OER more widely. And one of the last um, items that I've got here is this was a action plan. It was a report um, created by the library system. And um, the 2016 report, if you're interested, I can send you a link to it. Um, but basically, it, it reviewed what was happening in the nation. Um, then we made, they made recommendations for the OER, support of OER infrastructure. And then it also gave the results of a survey that was uh, conducted uh, with all 40 of our institutions for our librarians, instructional designers, and staff on their um, use of OER and some steps that they recommended for how we can um, facilitate the use of OER. And then within, um, on our site, Florida Shines, um, we have what's called a statewide course catalog of all the courses, uh, online courses that are offered throughout the state. Um, because in Florida, you can take courses from other institutions. 
So if a student is at one, one institution, I'll call it the home one, and they need to take a course and it's not available or they know that a particular course is not using um, um, a publisher textbook and it's an OER course, zero cost course, they might choose to try and take that course at another institution. So for our, on, our, on our statewide catalog, we are enabling a feature so that the students can sort the courses and find those OER zero cost courses uh, as well as zero cost programs. Um, one idea we floated is creating a database of textbooks, uh, open textbooks that are being used without, uh, throughout the state and tagging them with the, we have a common course numbering system. So if you're teaching um, English 1101, that English course has the same um, objectives as any other uh, English 1101 that's being taught at another university and the credits transfer. So to help faculty find these textbooks, it would be helpful if they could simply locate them and say, okay, these different faculty members are already using this book. I'm going to check it out. And they also would be a resource. So, um, and then of course, as I mentioned before, we want to expand the role of uh, the Orange Grove, our Florida repository, so we can provide more information to our, our state. Um, did you have any questions on how Florida is, is trying to address the issue of OER and the cost? Okay, any questions? Okay, so um, I was gonna ask um, about uh, this, HB 7019 um, bill uh -huh. and whether there was anything in there to your to your knowledge um, to do with the campus bookshops systems because it sounded like um, a lot of people were um, keen not to use the campus bookshop because it's more expensive but they were kind of um, bound to if they were receiving financial aid is there anything in the bill relating to that to your knowledge um, the, the use of financial aid is, is a, uh, as I understand, again, I'm not a financial aid expert. I think that is a, um, um, a national requirement. I, I don't think that, that they're able to change that. Um, I, wish, I wish students would be able to buy a book from anywhere they want, they want but they, they simply aren't able to. Not if they're using financial aid. So, but that's a good question. It does seem to me you've got quite a um, you've got quite a joined up approach, though. Different levels of policy, kind of um, organization and institutional organization around this. It's quite impressive. Do we have um, any questions from anybody in the chat box? Um, here we go. Do any yes, of the teachers create? Do any of the teachers? create ORs as the extra learning materials for their classroom. Um, some teachers do. The problem that we have is we don't have a systematic way throughout this, all our institutions to know what courses are utilizing only OER or only zero cost and what faculty members are creating their content. Um, that that is something that we need to find some sort of solution to be getting that information back from our campuses. And um, in all honesty, I don't know that because it's it's up to the faculty how they teach their course. Um, we would need the institutions to make that part of their reporting structure to be, so that we could get it. Uh. So, so I guess that's um, a sort of wider question around um, open educational practices as well, because we don't know necessarily what's happening with these books. We just know that they're using this textbook or that that open textbook. Um, is is open educational practices a phrase that's that's part of this conversation there in Florida? In Florida, 
Um, yes, I, I think more and more faculty understand what OER is and zero cost. Um, they understand that concept. Well, the, I'll be honest, a big, big problem continues to be, especially in the college level, if you're teaching five courses, um, it's important to, and you've got a, a publisher offering you a textbook and all the ancillaries, and by ancillaries, I mean the, you know, the PowerPoints, the test bank, et cetera, et cetera, then, it, or you can use this OER textbook, they tip it, and you have to create all those ancillaries. They typically, you know, I, I don't blame people for wanting to, to opt for that choice. Um, one problem that I see is it would be nice if we had this national database or something to where they could search and, and see, and, you know, not have the resource in there, but link to it so that you can find, okay, here's this company offers this OER textbooks and the OER ancillaries. You know, um, right now you have to go to so many different places and it's, it's very complex and time consuming for the faculty and that in, it, in itself is a huge hindrance. There needs to be an easier way to find all these resources and um, uh, the, the other thing for the faculty is, is truly if they they create it, they have to keep maintaining it, or if they find this great OER book, right, um, how do they know that it's going to be updated? So, and, and as far as creation, it goes back to the age old problem of at a university, they creating an OER book or is, is not part of promotion and tenure. And that's that's a it, that is a very big deal for them. So, but um, I, I will say, E and I are very interested in in trying to find. You know, we've been able to do this statewide research within Florida. I'd love to be able to have more opportunities, and and maybe I'm not connecting with the right groups, and and but. How can we make it so that it's easier to do collaborative research, either you know, from um, with other countries or even uh, with other states? Um, that's that to me is is how can we support that kind of research agenda? And it's, it's something so that we can find out, okay, what exactly do you need to be able to um, truly show that OER is successful and it'll work and it's sustainable. You know, I, I think then we can get more buy-in. We just, we need more hard data, I think. So, um, okay, great. Let's see, oerworldmap.org. So uh, that's okay. a good one, thank you. Um, yes, okay, so a that, yeah, that's, um, place uh, like OER is on. A project. Beg your pardon. Um, one of the aspirations of the world, well, one of the aspirations of the World Map Project is to facilitate this kind of um, uh, sort of retention of data around what's out there and how it's being used, and and, and also mm -hmm. to put people in touch with each other, so they'll be able yeah. to form these collaborative relationships and so on. Um, <clears throat> so, um, E, I noticed you're you're in the chat box there at the moment. Uh, was there anything you wanted to say? Because obviously it's been a bit harder for you to be heard because you're only on the chat there. Um, if there's any any sort of um, summary or anything you wanted to add, then feel free, and I'll I'll read it out for the benefit of the recording. Um, so a question from Bayer. Okay, so Bayer's following up on this idea of repositories um, and saying what's going wrong where people can't find these repositories. So it's not so much that the rep repositories don't exist. But I guess it's happening in silos, and people are building the same repository over and over again for different institutions, and and so on. It's okay. It's having that Thanks, single place um, to go. It, it, I, I think what what our our faculty are saying is they they understand that the resources and repositories are out there, but there's so many for them to dig through that that. And again, I'm repeating what people have told me. 
um, is that they want basically a one-stop shop, you know. Um, some of them only so it's a kind use of, um, systematic organization of what's a yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, please continue. I, 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 you froze on um, my screen, so I didn't realize I was talking over you. <laughs> no, it's quite all right. Um, I think I've pretty much summed it up. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, I finished a few minutes early on you, but um, I think that was that was pretty much it. I, I mean, and, and I'll be honest, we've offered um, uh, to, to do this same survey and analyze the data for, um, you know, if other states were interested in having us uh, do it for their state. Um, I have a lot of support, I, I think, in our organization for doing this kind of research, and I'm, I'm very fortunate um, to have that kind of support. Um, what are our hopes for the Orange Grove? I think that's coming out of the um, strategic, the state university system strategic plan. Um, what they would like to see us do is to have a statewide work group for the repository and OER in general and for and to come up with specific recommendations so that we have that roadmap map and we have a systematic way for the institutions to provide us with that feedback and um, uh, a way to show that if something needs to be done and there's a cost associated with it, that they have a way of, of saying that all, oops, all the institutions are behind this and, and ask for legislative budget requests. So I can't tell you what we want right now because they're in the process of coming up with that plan. Um, I have an Okay, so we have a question from Martin. Um, is improved retention now seen as a main driver, um, a, a main driver for academic success, I suppose, um, compared with improved performance um, and cost savings to students? Oh, as a driver for, is this a driver for adoption of, of uh, open textbooks? I'm, I, um, I would have to say that retention The, stu the institutions are always, always evaluated on student completion. Um, but I think it, they're going to be evaluated on a, a combined way. They want the, the legislature, the legislative staff want to know how much are these textbooks costing you? How uh, they want to know how, uh, what the success rate of the students are uh, in completion. But to say that retention is, is um, getting more notice, I, I couldn't answer that one. I just know the, the focus right now seems to be accessibility, quality, and affordability. Um, or degree, degree completion is a big deal, yes. They want these students finishing their degree, and they want them to finish their degree um, as in four years, if possible. You know, so and that just depends on if a student's a full-time student or a part-time student. So, um, I just uh, I just am not at an actual campus. So I really, that's just not a question that I, I've had. I wish I could answer that question, Martin, about whether uh, retention is, is uh, underplayed benefit. Um, it, it is very important. I know when I was at the, at a institution, uh, you always got, that always got reviewed at the, the me dean meetings, you know, what the retention and success was. Do you have any other questions? Good. Okay, does, doesn't look like it. So um, you're quite uh, welcome, James. We do have 
um, any follow-up questions that come to us, we'll maybe pass them on to you later. Okay, yes. And um, we also created an infographic for the report and I'll send it out. It's not on the website right this minute, um, but I can send it out to you if you want to share it to the people who participated. Yeah, we, what we'll do is we can add it to the uh, recording of this that's available afterwards. Um, also, once okay. it's available, if you let us know, we'll, we'll link to it or attach it directly. Okay, good deal. All right. Okay, then, I think thank we're you. all done. Um, thank you so much uh, to Robin and Eve for uh, coming and uh, speaking with us. And thanks to everyone for coming along and for your questions. Um, and we'll see you again next time. All right, great. Thank you. Bye-bye.